TSN's Motoring 96 is brought to you by Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life, and Midas, the way it should be. This is not the first time that we've dropped by an auto wrecking yard, but as you'll see later, this one is rather unique. And we'll also discover that there's a good and a bad side to running a business like this one. But first, we recently met some men who demonstrated their talents behind the wheel of a car for us. And in doing so, they gave us some ideas for our next edition of Test Drive. Although I must confess, we haven't mentioned anything to Graham Fletcher. Auto journalists were in for a real treat recently at the Atlanta Motor Speedway. Not only was former Saab rally great Eric Carlson in town, but he also brought along some very talented drivers. The Saab performance team is comprised of men who work in the technical division of Saab in Sweden. This was their first opportunity in North America to demonstrate that when a driver and machine become one, the results can be phenomenal. Yeah, this team started up at uh, 87 for 50 years anniversary and uh, we're using this uh, 900 turbo three-door sedan and that's uh, actually quite standard. We have done nothing but uh, increase the tire pressure. That's all we do. Speaking of tires, keep your eye on the left front. This exercise demonstrated the Saab's ability to react in an emergency situation with little or no driver input. Then it was time for the snake, led by team leader, Bank Dahl. To start off with the snake that we call it, I think it's uh, showing how smooth you can go and narrow to, without the car, you know, and uh, still have full control. You're the leader, Every, all the pressure's on you? Yeah, all the pressure is on me, you can say that, yeah. But that's, I don't know if, if it's easier to be in the front or in the, in the back, you know, they had to increase the speed a little bit more and when you do this turning and so on, but in front we have to, to keep the speed down to keep them steady back there. The speed increases for the next demonstration called the zigzag, which would leave no room for error. That's, that's a little bit tricky one, you know, because you can't be on top of each other because then you smash the, the rear end of the other car. And after that we do this uh, meeting, and that's, that's mostly uh, timing. Okay, as we clear the track... There are people called stunt drivers, but do you consider yourself stunt drivers or...? No, we are not stunt drivers. We are common guys who have done a lot of driving. I think we are quite experienced driver, all of us, because we have done a lot of rally driving back home in Sweden and other countries in Europe. I think we have been rally driving for 10, 15 years, all of us. So we, have the, we have the experience to, to drive a car on slippery roads, and that we use on the asphalt. The team effort, a chemistry, mm -hmm. how important is that among the team? I think it's quite important, well, otherwise it won't work. Everyone has to be on top of everything you know. and we all love to drive cars and that's that's the main thing I think. If we were from the beginning more using the turbocharger for its real benefit that is uh, improved emissions, reduced noise level, improved fuel economy because you can have a smaller engine for a given power etc then we would have been a little bit further down this road where we are aiming namely to make the turbocharger an as natural component of the car as starter motor or alternator or whatever because the turbocharger is the most powerful component we have now in order to meet all the future requirements. ever tested for motoring was a 1988 Nissan Pathfinder. For 1996 we get to road test the totally new version. This vehicle has been completely reworked from the road up. 
new engine, brakes, suspension, steering, the list goes on. As indicated, the Pathfinder is much more than a cosmetic makeover. The body, for instance, has been switched from the old body-on-frame style to unibody construction. As well as reducing weight and increasing the available space, courtesy of an extra two inches in the wheelbase, this new body works wonders in the stiffness department. So why on earth would anybody park a vehicle like this? Well, it's to demonstrate the torsional rigidity of this particular vehicle. The rear suspension is completely compressed. The front is lifted, which means the entire body is now being twisted. This vehicle, compared with the old Pathfinder, is three times better in terms of torsional strength. The result? You can actually open and close the door without fear of the body collapsing on you and you being stuck with the door left open. Off-road, the increased stiffness equates to much less flex and consequently fewer rattles and squeaks. The stiffer platform also gives the suspension a much better home base. Up front, the Pathfinder now uses a heavy-duty strut design that increases the available travel by 15 millimeters. In the rear is the same five-link design used in the past. Off-road, the longer travel and compliant feel means that the backwards experience is a lot less trying and the fact that the new suspension is better at keeping the wheels on the ground improves traction appreciably. In terms of pointability, the Pathfinder is much improved thanks to the adoption of rack and pinion steering. The precision, feel and feedback are all appreciated. The engine has also changed significantly. The displacement is now up to 3.3 litres. The resulting increase in power is tremendous. Torque rises to 196 pounds-feet, while horsepower rises to 168. The big bonus with the reworked engine is that 90% of the torque is developed between 1500 and 1800 RPM, meaning that the low-end grunt is excellent. Match with this engine is a choice of a 5-speed manual or 4-speed automatic with overdrive, with the automatic employing an on-off switch for the overdrive unit. This is particularly useful in hilly terrain or when off-road. The transfer case, whilst improved from last year's version, still comes up short because it's only a part-time system. The problem is that you are forced to drive in two-wheel drive most of the time. The instant you actually need four-wheel drive, it's usually too late to reach down and make the switch. The Pathfinder needs a full-time system. Now, the word from the grapevine suggests that Nissan have one in the works. When we'll see it, though, well, that's up for discussion. On road, the throttle response and mid-range performance are considerably better than before. A side benefit is that the extra power and performance has been achieved without sacrificing fuel economy. For those into towing, the new Pathfinder can pull up to 5,000 pounds when properly equipped. On road, the ride is a lot more civilized and far less truck-like than before, and the use of roll bars at both ends tames the amount of body roll to a car-like level. Stopping power is supplied by a disc drum setup that comes with anti-lock and a special G-sensor. The G-sensor is designed to improve the ABS performance when off-road. In general, it has the desired effect. For the record, I required 119 feet to stop from 80K. Inside, the Pathfinder ranges from utilitarian to a full-blown Luxo mobile. The latter coming complete with a full leather package, cruise control and just about every power option imaginable. In either case, the layout is logical and fully functional. The front seats are contoured, comfortable and provide the required level of support. The instrument panel is complete and easily interpreted and the rotary style heater controls and radio are readily reached and operated. The back seat is a 60-40 split folding affair that adds the required degree of versatility. When both halves are down, the cargo capacity increases from 37.5 to 75.5 cubic feet. On the safety front, the Pathfinder comes with standard anti-lock brakes, dual airbags and three-point seat belts in all outboard positions. Well, that's it for this edition of Test Drive. You know, Nissan have done a good job with the new Pathfinder. The stiffer body, revised suspension and rack and pinion steering help things immensely, whether on or off-road. If there is a drawback, though, it lies in the fact that they still do not offer a full-time four-wheel drive system.
I'm inside the showroom at Bay Auto Wreckers. A showroom, you say? Well, like I mentioned earlier, this is not your typical wrecking yard. For many years, the do-it-yourselfer in search of bargain auto parts would have to pay a visit to the junkyard. A messy job for sure, and you could spend an entire day looking for a single component as inventory control was not exactly a high priority. But that was then. We, we're now no longer junkyards. Uh, that, that, that's a no-no in our business. We're now auto dismantlers and recyclers. Um, the junkyard is the old uh, place, you know, where they had the car stacked three high and grease all over the place. As you can see from our operation here with the, uh, how we keep the, uh, you know, the floors clean, everything is, is, is washed and cleaned, the parts. So it's more like a used auto parts store than it is a, a junkyard. The parts are all tested and cleaned now, and uh, it makes it easier for our customers to handle the parts, to get the parts, and, and to put the parts on. What makes us unique is that uh, instead of the typical junkyard or auto dismantlers, we're, we bring the cars in, dismantle them, put, test the parts out, put the parts up in shelves. They're all marked and ready to go, and we're fully computerized uh, with satellite access all over uh, Canada and the United States. So if we haven't got a part, and a customer needs a part, we can try to find it for them. If it's available anywhere in the country, of Canada or the United States, we should be able to find them the part. Different people come in the showroom looking for parts or looking for rebuildable cars. And it could be body shops, it could be private people, just about anybody that's interested in cars. We have stolen recovered cars that we get from the insurance companies, cars with some damage that are repairable again. If some of these cars that we get in, we will find parts for them to supply the used parts to allow them to fix the car. And by this way, having a showroom inside, the people can come and look at the car, uh, start them up, uh, even drive them around if they have to, and jack them up and look underneath them so we let the people see what they're buying. Yeah, that's, a, that's a customer's part. We mainly appeal to people who don't want to pay the price of, uh, of a new part, because our prices are probably about a third of what a new part is. Uh, there's two sides to our business. Uh, the good side where you get a car in where you know no one's been hurt. We also get the cars in that uh, there's been a fatality in. Uh, and unfortunately most of the time it's caused by uh, drinking and driving. Over there the uh, Beretta, it was, it was a uh, alcohol related uh, incident where two people were, were uh, killed. One driver who was at fault, who went through a red light and hit another uh, innocent uh, person uh, in her car and, and also uh, killed her. That's the really sad part. So if I had one thing to say to the public is, uh, you know, don't drink and drive. It's, it's, it's just not worth it. This week we want to talk a little bit about steering pulls. First of all, what are we talking about when we say steering pulls? Well, we're talking about the tendency of a vehicle to pull itself slightly to the right or slightly to the left when you relax your grip on the steering wheel. Now I happen to know that this vehicle has an alignment problem, but before you go ahead and do a wheel alignment, there's certain things you need to check. For example, ask yourself the question, was this pull consistent and was it always in one direction? If it wasn't consistent, it could have been as simple as driving in a crosswind situation or a road that was a little bit off camber one way or the other. If your pulling problem is pretty consistent and you've ruled out factors like crosswind or road crown situations, one of the next things you want to check is tire inflation pressure. Get that tire pressure gauge out check all four tires in that vehicle to make sure they're up to spec. The next thing you want to have a look at is the condition of the tires themselves. See if there's any uneven or erratic wear patterns set up on those tires. For example, the front tire in this vehicle, you can see that the inside of it is very heavily worn as opposed to the outside. That's going to cause a problem with this vehicle no matter what. Now how did that pattern set up? Well, it was as a result of a wheel alignment problem. So that's another thing that you need to correct before you put new tires on. Another thing that could cause a vehicle to pull excessively is brake system problems. For example, if you've got a brake caliper that's stuck or partially seized, that can pull the vehicle in one direction when you're driving and the other direction when you apply the brakes. Certainly, uh, if you have a pull situation that only occurs under braking, you want to have a look at that vehicle's brake system. Obviously, that's a very unsafe condition that you don't want to uh, live with. If you're driving on uh, wet or snow-packed roads, it could be uh, a severe problem. One other thing we should mention is the fact that radial tires sometimes can cause pulls and show no erratic or uneven wear patterns. So if you've had the alignment done on your vehicle and your, your tires are evenly worn, you've still got a pull, ask the alignment or service technician to think about cross-rotating or moving the front tires to the rear axle. 
If that gets rid of your problem, you've confirmed that you do have what we refer to as a polar tire. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 96. Along with the driving performance team, Saab brought its lineup for 1996 to the Atlanta Motor Speedway. Since Saab's 50-50 merger with General Motors, business has been good, with Saab sales up 26% from last year. I think some of our, our loyal base are still sitting and waiting. You know, they wanted to see a, I mean, the, you know, the transition from a, a Saab Scania network to a General Motors base network, which, you know, Passport, Saturn, Saab, Isuzu. It's taken a while, but they've seen the commitment that we've put towards Saab, you know. They're seeing more advertising in Saab. They're seeing newer and brighter and better facilities at Saab. And they're seeing our sales success, and they're starting to, to believe that, uh, that Saab still will have a strong presence in Canada. Many of the new Saabs are equipped with turbochargers. Saab engineers believe the turbo is the way of the future, yet are puzzled as to why it gets so little respect in North America. It shouldn't, but uh, I'm afraid you're right. We have uh, used the turbocharger mainly for performance, and when you are aiming at performance, you always take a risk in smaller safety margins in all directions. Uh, however, what we have missed in our communication is that a turbocharger is a wonderful equipment because it takes back some of the losses you make in your exhaust system, and brings it back into the engine and creates power for on the front wheels. This is a central part of a turbocharger. It has a turbine wheel and a compressor wheel and a shaft in between. The exhaust gases are coming around here and is spinning the turbine wheel. It produces up to 25 horsepower, which are transmitted to the compressor and the compressor pumping air into the engine, which means that a small engine can deliver a lot of power because it gets a lot of air from the compressor and one horsepower typically taken from the exhaust produces four horsepower on the crankshaft in the engine. And when you need it. And when you need it and you have the small engine for fuel economy when you don't need the power. And when are we going to see this turbocharger? That turbocharger is very much the same as what is already in our production cars. It's a little bit smaller because it belongs to a project engine but it looks absolutely standard if you like. Pair Gilbrand also thinks there is too much emphasis on horsepower in North America and not enough emphasis on torque. Horsepowers only tell you what the engine performs at the very top speed of uh, RPM. That is the uh, top speed of the car if you like. Torque is what you are using when you are cruising in normal traffic conditions from the day to day work and all that sort of thing. And if we could get away from horsepower and talk about torque, we could be much more, we could have a much more easy communication in between us when we come to real life performance. As promised, it's time for the tail of the tape and the costs incurred so far in our long-term Tacoma. We've had the first service done and the springs, well, they no longer creak. On the subject of the dealer, well, our experience there was very positive indeed. One other thing has come to light in the last little while, and that's the sound quality from the radio. It needs a couple of extra speakers in the rear. That would sort things out. And as promised, now the numbers. Midas tip of the week concerns tire inflation pressures. Very important factor that needs to be considered on a regular basis. All too many motorists overlook this basic and simple check. First of all, you want to check the tire inflation placard on your vehicle. It's usually on the driver's door or on the door jam, maybe on the trunk lid or in the glove compartment. If it isn't there or you can't find it, consult your owner's manual. There may be different pressures specified for some vehicles. For example, certain vehicles have optional tire sizes that require different inflation pressures. And it may also vary depending on the load factor. In any case, it's usually clearly stated on that placard or in the owner's manual. You should check it monthly. Buy yourself a tire gauge. Keep it clipped to the sun visor of the vehicle and you'll see it there on an occasional basis. It'll remind you to check those tire inflation pressures. That's your Midas 
tip of the week. How many of those drivers are impaired? Too many. A program to get them off the road next on Kenzie's Corner. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. Ontario will soon join Nova Scotia, Manitoba and 40 U.S. states in introducing administrative license suspensions for drunk drivers. If a cop spots a drunk and he blows over .08 on the roadside tester, he's hauled off to the station. There, a licensed technician administers two separate tests to make sure the results are accurate. They're faxed to the Ministry of Transportation and the Registrar of Motor Vehicles can issue a 90-day license suspension on the spot. The cop takes the license, the perp takes a cab. The process is called administrative because it does not involve criminal charges or a court case. Of course, the police can and probably will lay additional charges which could lead to further penalties. Now, there's a couple of problems with administrative license suspensions. First of all, it currently takes about three hours for a cop to process a single drunk. The new system will probably take longer. A 10-person roadside spot check program then could be lucky to process 12 drunks in a shift. That's a drop in the bucket. The hope, of course, is that the threat of license suspension will deter drivers from driving drunk. Other jurisdictions claim up to 50% success rate with this program. The other problem is 63% of all drunk driving convictions go to repeat offenders, many of whom are already driving under suspension. Clearly, these people are beyond deterrence. Only when our government's courts are prepared to recognize that killing somebody with a motor vehicle is every bit as reprehensible as killing somebody with a gun in a restaurant robbery are we going to have a serious impact on drunk driving. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, obviously people drop by wrecking yards to pick up auto parts, but in our visit here we've discovered another good reason to pay your local yard a visit, especially if you happen to have some young drivers in the family. You're more than likely going to find plenty of examples like this one of how the wonderful driving experience can end up in tragedy. And you know, it's also a sobering reminder to all of us of any age of the responsibility that we accept when we carry a driver's license. That's it for now. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and the people who drive them. The whole nature of vehicle technician is very different than it used to be. These vehicles are so complex now. These people are really professionals and they don't get uh, that recognition that they should. Uh, something like this gives them a bit of that recognition, but it also gives them a lot of self-confidence and, uh, and self-image, I think. One thing that's unique that we found is when to keep a bug simple, you know, people don't look for it. Well, we had one technician last year that went through the competition and he found a burnout light bulb and it took an hour to find it. TSN's Motoring 96 has been brought to you by Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life, and Midas, the way it should be.